Welcome to the Five Books for Catholics podcast, where experts explain their pick of five outstanding books on an aspect of Catholic life, doctrine, or culture. The Jesuit Henri de Lebac, 1896 to 1991, was a major influence on the Second Vatican Council, and on theologians such as Hans Urs von Balthasar and Josef Ratzinger, with whom he founded the journal Comunio. In 1942, he and some fellow Jesuits founded Source Chrétienne, a series that publishes the original texts of patristic and medieval Christian writings alongside a French translation. He thereby stimulated within Catholic theology a return to its sources. Putting this ressourcement into practice in his own works, he argued that the Church should retrieve the patristic understanding of the Eucharist, the Church, creation, grace, and scripture. In 1983, Pope John Paul II created him a cardinal. Approaching de Lebac's vast oeuvre may be daunting. Fortunately, Dr. David Grummet is here to give an overview of de Lebac and explain what you should read first. David Grummet is a senior lecturer in theology and ethics at the University of Edinburgh. He has recently published Henri de Lebac and the Shaping of Modern Theology, a reader, with Ignatius Press. Professor David Grummet, thank you for accepting this interview and welcome. It's a pleasure. Thank you for having me. Henri, who was Henri de Lebac and what makes him one of the most influential Catholic theologians of the 20th century? Well, de Lubac was a uh, French Jesuit. He was born in uh, 1896 and died in 1991. So he really had an incredible lifespan. He fought in the First World War and he lived to see the start of the fall of communism. So he really had a sort of incredible historical sweep. So his his theology was rooted in this sort of tumultuous, if you like, short 20th century. So it begins with the problems between church and state in France. So the Jesuits actually get kicked out of France along with the other religious orders. So he uh, undertakes most of his formation overseas in the British Channel Islands and on the south coast of England. Uh, but even though there's this, the, the French state expels the religious orders, it doesn't allow them to, to teach in France, nevertheless it expects them to return and fight. So he comes back and he's catapulted from this sort of fairly safe, conservative seminary situation into the maelstrom of war. And he comes into contact with a far wider group of people uh, than he had done before. And this shapes his theological engagements and concerns. He then uh, becomes a teacher of theology in Lyon at the Catholic uh, faculty there. And he lives in the Jesuit house at Fourvier. And in, in this time, he gets interested alongside Christian theology, really in in sort of fundamental theology. So understanding the wider social and, and even religious contexts in which Christian belief is situated. He's he's interested in the sort of notion of religion as, as well as the Christian faith. So he's already uh, been expelled from France and had to come back to, to, to fight for his country. But then in, in the 1930s, a, a, a new challenge comes on the horizon, which is anti-Semitism in France. And he is one of a surprisingly small number of Roman Catholic clergy and religious who, from the start, see that this is completely unacceptable. It's something they need to fight against. So de Lubac in Lyon has a leading role in the spiritual resistance to anti-Semitism and to the Vichy regime at some personal danger uh, during the early 1940s. Now, when when the war ends, one might have thought that he would have been thanked 
for his troubles by the church hierarchy, but he quickly becomes enveloped in a controversy around sort of theology and, and the idea of the supernatural. And he he is he is accused really of sort of departing from uh, approved theology. So he uh, during the 1950s is really a bit of an outcast. He uh, teaches uh, not on uh, Christian theology, but but uh, he he in t- and takes several years researching in areas of philosophy and uh, Japanese Buddhism, interestingly. So he sees this particular form of Buddhism in in Japan uh, that he called Amidism or, or, or Pure Land Buddhism, as it would be called now, as having some interesting sort of echoes of of Christian belief. However, as some will be aware, Dlubak is uh, quite suddenly rehabilitated in the run up to the Second Vatican Council, uh, which took place from 1962 to 1965. And he is appointed one of the French theological experts at the council. And he takes a significant role in the theological conversation that contributes to the drafting of the documents of the council that are still tremendously important in the church today. In the wake of the council, he becomes critical of of what he sees as excessively liberal interpretations of of its teaching. He he becomes really an an apologist for uh, sort of classic uh, doctrinal loci, the importance of of the church, uh, sin. And he he is concerned along with 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 other other clergy of his generation, such as uh, Pope Emeritus Benedict XVI, that society is moving in ways that 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 could become destructive. And the purpose of the church is really to speak quite clearly uh, and not not lose sight of of traditional doctrinal and moral teaching. He's pleased at the election as Pope of uh, of, uh, uh, of as Pope of Pope John Paul II, who he had good uh, interactions with during the Second Vatican Council. He he's really pleased that someone who had had a leading role and continued to have a leading role, of course, in the fall of communism, uh, was was Pope. Uh, for him, that was a really important. Um, sign and important in the sort of Christian combat against communism that that he saw as one of the sort of great spiritual uh, conflicts of the later 20th century. And also uh, the uh, appointment as Archbishop of, of Paris of, of Cardinal Lustiger, who was uh, born a Jew and, as it says, on his memorial inscription in Notre Dame, uh, remained a Jew, even though he became a Christian. Uh, this de Lubac perhaps saw as a, as a kind of rounding off of the hostility between many Christians and Jews, the, the failure of Christians to stand up for Jews in France in the, in the earlier 20th century, and a recognition really that the Christian faith comes fundamentally out of the tradition of Israel described in the Old Testament and by Paul in the New, uh, that, that that preceded it. And you've mentioned uh, that Dulebach, after a period out in the theological desert in the 1950s, in the wake of the encyclical Mani Generis, um, then played a role in the Second Vatican Council. Has he shaped the teaching of Vatican II to some extent and subsequent pap- papal teaching? Yes, I think he has. And w- we, we might see in some greater detail areas in which he's contributed when we when we look at the five books. But 
just to take a, a couple for now, if one thinks of the 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 importance of of the church as 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 seen today, not as an administrative institution in in some way sort of paralleling the state or a government department, but actually as the organic living body of Christ. This this was uh, an idea that was tremendously important to Lubach. To Lubach, he spent a lot of time looking into its history, and he was he was highly critical of of understandings of the church that just saw it as a bureaucratic organisation rather than Christ's organic body composed of the bishops and other clergy and 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 people in it. Uh, also, also de Lubac's approach to scripture is, 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 has, I think, been sort of under the surface really important in, in sort of the methodology of the council. If one looks back at the documents of, of previous councils, scripture often isn't cited much. Uh, there's much more citation of previous church teaching. Uh, but de Lubac saw the relationship between scripture and doctrine as, as, ver as very close. And he, he thought we should really should be returning to scripture and understanding how doctrinal themes come out of that. And, and he even saw Christ, I think it'd be fair to say, as present in scripture and revealed in scripture in some sense analogously to how Christ is present in and revealed through the Eucharistic host. So if we think of, of, of worship, uh, so Christ is present in the host, but Christ is also present in scripture. So this sort of parallelism of sacrament and word was important to him. And and the, the fact that the life of the church is ex, is ex, well, it's not just expressed in worship, it's actually, in a sense, coming out of worship. So uh, one of the phrases rightly associated with de Lubac is that the Eucharist makes the church. So it's through the church's collective prayer and worship that its identity and other areas of its life and reflection come. And what drew you to study de Lubac? Well, my uh, PhD thesis was on the theology of another French Jesuit, Pierre Teilhard de Chardin, who was about 15 years before de Lubac and uh, quite controversial in his in his time for his ideas about sort of theology and evolution, and is the, the relationship between theology and science more, more widely. So one might think that de Lubac would, would, would not be interested in him because de Lubac might be regarded as, as someone sort of thoroughly anchored in, in classic doctrine and spending most of his time writing and thinking about that. But actually de Lubac wrote several books on Tehar and had great respect for him and and spent so a lot of time defending his fellow Jesuit from misinterpretation and false accusation. So, so it, yes, it was really through having worked on one French Jesuit, I moved into working, working on another and perhaps the, was the really the greatest, greatest uh, French Jesuit of the 20th century in terms of of his impact on the church and the the importance of his work uh, and, and 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 the sheer volume of it, uh, the uh, French publisher Serf, based in Paris, is currently publishing De Lubac's complete works and expects that will run to fifty volumes. That project. Now, De Lubac's Catholicism is not only the first book in your list, but also his first published book. Joseph Ratzinger stated that reading this book in 1949 was an essential milestone in his theological journey. Mm. Why is this book so important? Why have you put it first on your list? Mm. Well, it's the closest de Lubac gets really to 
a sort of systematic theology. But by that I mean uh, in a single volume, laying out uh, in a structured way uh, the, the the key th theological topics as he sees them in Christian doctrine. I mean, before I talk talk briefly about the structure of the book and the content, I should perhaps just say in terms of the methodology, uh, there's a big section at the back where he is uh, sort of reproducing texts by theologians from sort of Christian history. So I'm holding the book up now. You can see that at, at the back there's a good, uh, how many is it, so 70 pages or so, where he is reproducing texts from the early church fathers and medieval theologians that he thinks are important for Christian doctrine today. So this big appendix shows us a, a key plank of his methodology, which is resourcement, resourcing or re-resourcing theology for the present day using historic sources, sort of reconnecting theology with, with with its roots so it can sort of take up again the goodness from those roots and it's wonderful reading through some of those and sort of reflecting on why why he might might think that each one is important yes so 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 this book he he goes he goes through in part beginning with with the dogma in the church and ending with reflections on 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 transcendence so, as I was saying, the the importance of of the church as re really the the outworking of of fundamental facts about humankind, as reflected in in Christian doctrine. So, so for de Lubac, it's important that we are all one in Adam. Humanity is is essentially a collective concept. So contrary to sort of modern individualism, de Lubac doesn't see humanity ultimately as lots of isolated individuals. No, ra rather he sees humanity as fundamentally collective. We're all created in Adam, in God's image. And that's why we are called into the church, Christ's collective organic body, as I was was saying earlier. Uh, so from the church, he talks about the sacraments and he talks first about baptism and penance before he moves on to the Eucharist. I mean, this this is interesting because it reminds us that that back when de Lubac published this uh, in 1947, actually regular reception of the Eucharist was was not common among a lot of Christians as it is now. Rather, confession was the sacrament that uh, they would probably most frequently have received. Uh, so we see a bit of sort of Christian history hidden away in there. But nevertheless, Lubac quickly moves to the Eucharist and so sort of says sort of, this produces the church, uh, and. He, he he reflects a bit on sort of Christ's different bodies. We see the body present on the altar. We 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 have Christ's body now resurrected in heaven, and we have Christ's body, the church. So for to look back, the the correspondence between these different bodies of Christ is hugely important, and it's principally displayed in the Eucharist. And this leads us into into eternal life. Uh, in the second of the three parts, he he looks at sort of Christianity from from an historical perspective, and this is important to him because it it really gets him into reflecting on why Christianity arose when it did why did why did jesus come went, went into the world incarnate as a human went, went, when he did so de lubac sees the 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 lead up to this as really important so for him ancient israel is the sort of original type of the church really uh, in 
it uh, God chooses the people of Israel. He, he chooses a group, not a particularly big group, not a particularly big or or privileged or, or wealthy or powerful group. But he chooses this this little group of people, uh, this sort of collection of, of tribes, and they become God's chosen people. Israel are, are God's elect people. So for Delubak, that that sort of shows a key, key fact about the church. The church, the Christians that make it up, are God's chosen people. And this strong sense of continuity between ancient Israel and the church also comes comes out in this part because de Lubac gives a very good overview of his uh, understanding of scripture. So uh, perhaps we've become a bit sort of over occupied in, in the present day with the idea there's a sort of conflict between a literal interpretation of scripture on one hand and a sort of figurative on the other. And uh, and there's this kind of it's one or the other. But de Lubac uh, reflects on sort of the medieval fourfold exegesis of scripture, as he calls it. So so for the medievals, there were four or perhaps we should say at least four different ways of reading scripture. There is the literal sense. So 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 ev every book of scripture has some kind of narrative uh, that might be historically true or certainly makes historical sense as a description of events. Uh, it has an allegorical sense that there are there are things that are interpreted uh, such as by by Paul reading the Old Testament uh, when he's talking about Hagar, uh, the, the uh, people and events in the Old Testament can signify the church or different parts of Chris, Christian theology or can point us forward to Christ. Then there's the, the moral meaning of scripture. Lots of parts of scripture have have a moral message and, and that's important alongside the uh, literal and the allegorical and also the eschatological. This is the fourth big, big sense of scripture de Lubac identifies. Scripture sort of points us forward to something in in the future, some kind of future consummation that, that we can only sort of dimly understand at the present. So so we we, we we can't understand scripture simply by looking back into past history. It challenges us through calling us forward to. And perhaps the final thing in this second of the three parts I'll draw out. Again, coming back to de Lubac's collective sort of theological anthropology. Uh, he has a strong sense that just as the creation of humans was was collective. We're all one in Adam. So all humanity will be saved collectively. Uh, the idea of collective salvation has sometimes been misunderstood as saying, well, oh, sort of individual sins don't matter or, oh, this means that people of all religions will just be sort of brought in and it won't matter what your faith has been during your life. But but de Lubac says, uh, no, salvation is collective because of this fundamental fact about humanity. So that doesn't mean that sort of universal salvation will be easily achieved, very far from it. But nevertheless, he thinks that for deep theological reasons, it is collective so that, w that during our lives, we need to continue working for unity amongst peoples of the world and peoples of faith. But that sort of Ultimately, at the very end of things, somehow everyone will be brought back together again uh, beyond all the sort of divisions and conflicts we have in present life. So in the third part of Catholicism, he, he really defends ideas about the person and about transcendence. 
it, it's become popular to think, well, all we all, all that exists and is true is what we can see with our senses in the world around us. Uh, but but de Lubac very much wants to say, no, present reality sort of points us upwards towards something greater, but not in a way that disconnects us from other people and from from society. As I've said a couple of times already, this collective dimension is really important to him. Uh, but in a way that actually sort of deepens interpersonal bonds and uh, really sort of gives new meaning to to all, to all our sort of daily interactions. So he's wanting to sort of pull us beyond thinking that sort of what we have, what we what we do, what we achieve in earthly terms in our lives is most important. No, he wants us to sort of look upwards collectively and and get a sense of what God is calling us to as a society uh, in our lives. So those those are some some of the broad bones of Catholicism. Thank you for listening. To read or listen to the rest of this interview, or to support this podcast, visit the website fivebooksforcatholics.com and become a premium subscriber. If you've enjoyed this episode, please subscribe to this podcast on the platform of your choice so that more people can discover it and give it a five-star review on Apple Podcasts. Until next time, God bless.